tonight. Got it. One switch. That's the way I need it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be with you. Amen. Uh, this first weekend of the year. I'm glad I brought a New Year's sermon. I'll have to preach it some other time because I'm not preaching it tonight, but uh, I'm going to open your Bible to Titus 2. Thank you, Pastor Campbell and church for having us in. It's a pleasure to be here amongst you. I got a thrill out of this. Amen. Seeing generations. And I so appreciate the grace of God working in our lives. And uh, met uh, Jimmy and Renee years ago. He first came out to Pioneer on the West, East Coast. Uh, as a youngster, I think he had four or five whiskers. And, <laughs> and I, was, I had hair. Uh, I was younger. Time goes on. Isn't it good to still be in the will of God Amen. and in the house of God? So tonight, I'm going to preach a sermon I call The Works of Grace. And uh, people need to have a good understanding. You and I do. We need to have a good understanding and keep it all of our days. That grace is not just a, a moment we had with God that saved us. How many of you run into people who live like the devil and tell you it's by grace and they were saved? Right? And it's, it's over. So grace to many people on our planet is just kind of a confusing issue. It really is. It's, they don't get it. They, they, uh, they abuse it. And so grace comes to us at absolutely no cost to us. Uh, we weren't out searching for it. Uh, God found us. You know, you might have to change your bumper sticker if it says you found it. Amen. It didn't happen. He found you. He reached out to us. We didn't know how to reach out. You may have been trying, looking for God, looking for help, but it was his grace that broke through. You got to always know that. And it saved us at no cost to us. But, you know, it changes us. It doesn't just have, we don't just have a moment. We have a transformation. A new, new heart generated. God begins to work. I want to share from my testimony as I preach tonight. I did this, uh, preach a little bit of this a couple years ago, more of my testimony than I generally do at a, in a church I was ministering in. And I had several people ask me to tell a little more. And they told me how much it helped them. You have a testimony. And you have to let that out. Keep it out. Let people know it. It doesn't go, grow old. I know I'm going to be going back years, almost 50 years, talking about things that happened. You say, how can you remember? I wrote it down. Amen. That's how I know. And it was me. And it was real. And I checked with my wife. She heard me preach this sermon. She said, yeah, you got it. But just don't tell them everything. Amen. It's okay. Because we were rank sinners. I know I look like a respectable old grandpa. Amen. A nice guy preacher, but I was a sinner, good one, amen. And so about 46 or 7 years ago, some of the guys I lived with, my wife and I had moved up to Payson, Arizona. We were in our early 20s. We were from the East Valley here, Apache Junction area. I'd been in trouble all my life. My I came from a ruined home family, just, uh, just an absolute dysfunctional mess, you know. It wasn't a family and so I, I thought, like many young guys at 16 or so, getting out on the streets, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. I got it. I got to make my way. I'm a man. I destroyed my life quickly. And so we're in our early 20s. We're already married. We're together six years, married five, and uh, we're up there in the mountains. Just got out of enough trouble with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department to leave the valley. That's where I was at. I just got cleared to go ahead and leave, and they said, probably don't come back, you know. Uh, and I was walking on eggshells. I should have been, but I was so reckless that I, I didn't because I knew one more mistake, and I was going away, you know, at doing time, and I didn't want to do that. Now, you know, as crazy as I was, I just, but I couldn't change myself. We ran to the mountains, and we got free to leave out of here, went up there, and you know what I found? I was still there, amen. All my problems went with me. My wife rejoiced. There was only three bars back then up in the high country. She could usually find me somewhere, a couple party houses or the bars, you know. And so we're living up there, working construction. And the guys I'm working with, some of them you may know, Dave Stevenson, some of you may know Doc Wilson up in the Prescott Church. There's a few other brothers from back in those days still around somewhere. Uh, but, you know, that church in Payson was an embryo stage. Only about a dozen folks just started Got going a year or so, and some of these guys were getting saved, and I knew them. I worked with them. I partied and drank with some of them, and I, 
I, I thought they were like me, you know. And so when they changed, and they changed, I don't even know, salvation changed you. And when these guys changed, it was night and day difference. I didn't, you didn't have to be real smart to know that's not the same person. They go home to their wives. They go home in the daytime hours. They don't, you know, they're not, not out carousing, doing all this stuff we do. They, they quit doing the drugs. They're not drinking. And I, I'm, I'm just shocked because I've never been around Christian people. Never. I raised a Catholic, and we were, I, I drank like a Catholic. I was, sorry if you're, you get that person. You know, it's, it's the truth. I was just a lost soul. And so here, these men are getting saved. And I, I didn't know what salvation is, never heard it. I'm at the little beer joint my wife works at. She's back there tending bar and serving hamburgers. You know, a little place up in the mountains there. Uh, two of these men's wives worked there, and Doc came in to pick up his wife that evening. I was sitting there drinking beer, smoking cigarettes. I saw him coming in. I ordered him a beer. And he came up and sat down. I said, good evening. Hey, Dave. He goes, hey, man, here, I got you a beer. He said, oh, no, no, thanks. I quit. I said, you quit? I seen you two days ago. You always drink. No, I quit. I slid my cigarettes down. I was a generous soul with that case. I, you know, I slid it right down. I said, have a smoke, man. No, he smoked. Same brand. He said, no, nah, I quit. I said, what happened to you? You Okay. He says, yeah, I got saved. I never heard that. Never heard anyone say that. He got saved. I said, well, have a beer anyway, you know. <laughs> got saved, so what? He said, no, no, I gave my life to Christ, and that's all I remember from that conversation. I walked away. I told my wife, he's strange. He's, he lost it. Something's weird. I don't know. Got religion, you know. And so no longer my friend, you know, we're, we're done. But he didn't, that wasn't the end of him. He'd still hunt me down. Payson was very small back then. Several of these men, you couldn't hide anywhere up there. They would preach to me. I worked with a handful of them, a little construction crew. And every day, it seemed like through the course of times, it took me a long time as a stubborn soul. They did witness to me. They did preach to me. But every day, I would seem to look to myself more evil. They weren't putting their finger in my nose and telling me what an evil sinner I was. But I don't even know when the love of God and the grace of God is shining around you, you know, you, you begin to see you're not all that pretty. My sin was killing me. It was eating me up. I was losing the ability to communicate. I, at that point in my life, I was illiterate. I could sound out words, but I could, had zero comprehension. I couldn't read and tell you what I'm reading in a paragraph. I was, I was a mess. I really launched at a very young age into some heavy drugs. I didn't have an education. And so here I am all screwed up. And these men, for a year, they preached to me at work until I would shoot them down with vulgarity and bad remarks about their mama, their God, their church. I did day in, day out. I wanted to quit my job because they worked there, but I would just get uglier and uglier. And so time went on. And I want to tell you, there's this thing called grace. Amen. And here's what Titus 2 tells us. I want to stop there, read this scripture. Verse 11 and 12, just two verses. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. That's what began to appear to me. And that's what these men had received. It brings salvation. It appears and it brings it. Now, it also teaches us, verse 12 says, to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So that grace goes far beyond the initial act of salvation. That is a wonder, isn't it not the salvation? But you know, that's the start of it. And then it begins to teach us and it begins to apply help from heaven in our lives. And that we begin to reflect the change, the transformation, the nature of God from within our lives. Now, I had resisted this for, it was actually uh, 12 months, almost 14. I know it was close to 14 and, uh, you know, I'm just in my young 20s, you know, 20, I'm almost 23. And one night, God touched my life. I just finally begin to give up. Now, there's quite a story behind that because I was a hopeless case. First time I heard that uh, from the legal aspect, I heard it from teachers. I heard it from my parents. I heard it from folks that knew me. I heard it from people I ran around with who, when I was in my youth, their parents. I heard it from the judge when I was 18. I heard it, heard it, heard it, you know, and I believed it because I knew me. 
I mean, I, I, I always thought it was just a miracle I'm alive. Not a miracle, but just a wonder, you know, just I'm alive. I lived at a breakneck speed because I, I just didn't think anything of life. Why, why worry? Why not just go for the gusto, you know? And by the grace of God, I survived various overdoses, different things. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff. Benita said, don't tell it all. No need to. You get the picture. God's a mess. And, and so here I am, and these guys preaching to me, day, time's going on, and you know what? I begin to realize, man, I am not changing for the better. And I wanted to. I had a wife. I had a four-year-old boy now. And I'm thinking, man, he had needs. He was handicapped real bad. And I, I just, uh, I, so I begin to try. You know, I'm going to clean up my act. I'm just going to try. You know, I failed miserably, like the first day. That wasn't going to work. There's no, no cleaning yourself up. I'll tell you, you can't do that. You need a miracle. The reason being, like Ephesians 2 tells us, I was like all men, dead in my trespasses and sins. Uh, that's how we are. We, can't, we don't have the wherewithal to just... Compl- now, some people can clean up their act, but they can't save their soul. You know, I couldn't do either one. And so as for you, Ephesians 2, 1 says, you're dead in your sins and trans- your transgressions and sins, and in which you li- used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest We were by nature's deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when you were dead in your transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. So we didn't have the wherewithal to pull ourselves up from the death that we were suffering because of our sin, the darkness, the the destruction, the ruin of our lives. God had to intervene. And that's what he did in our lives, every one of us. If you're, well, I was a good person. You're, you were dead in your sin. And you had to have grace. That's how we got saved. So our getting found by God in itself is a miracle. This grace that has been revealed to all men. This grace that saves. It's, it's a wonder. Amen. And so this is what happened to all of us. And so now, now that we're saved, you know, uh, well, my wife went to church one day. Here I am. I'm not saved yet. I'm miserable. I am getting desperately miserable. She's worried about me. After all that time, she's finally worried about me. I mean, she, she was wondering, had she married? She, well, you know, you, like-minded, you know, we were a mess together. She's a good woman. I love her greatly. We just celebrated 50 years. Amen. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And, you know, but she was just as lost as me. But now she's worried because I'm losing the ability to make sense. My brain's just scrambled. I'm losing my job, which the guy I worked with liked me. We were friends. And I worked hard for him and I made him money. But when you're dangerous at work, it's not good. When they're having to wake you up in the middle of the day and wonder, are you in there? Amen. It's not good on construction sites. So everything was going sour bad, man. That was the grace of God trying to wake me up. One night, my wife, she knows, she does. These guys, I hate that church. I hate those people. I hate what they say. I, she, but you know what? We knew the people. There's a small church, and we knew several of the people. They knew us. But my wife was softening up. She begins to believe and seek God, and she lies to me one night and tells me, you know, I'm going to go to town and go by your sister Sue's. You want to go? She knows I don't want to go by her house. I said, no, I'll stay home. And so she went and went by my sister's house and went to church. She lied. In a Christian sort of way. <laughs> so she goes to church. The preacher sees her there. They know her. She's, she got saved. And she's afraid to tell me. You know what? I, I was explosively crazy. I didn't abuse her, but I was crazy. So I'm home alone in desperation, man. I, I've lost it. That night, I, this is, listen, I'm sitting home because I can't no longer go out in public. I, I know I'm dangerous. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm in trouble with people. I'm I can't control myself. I'm, I'm losing it. 
So I'm home. She goes to church. The preacher asked her, how's your husband? She goes, oh, you know, he's, she says, you know what? I know about him. The guy's, we're praying for him. And she says, oh, no, don't waste your prayers on him. My wife. And the, fi- the rest of that quote is pray for someone who can use them. Because he can't. That's how we work. Now, listen, I'm saying all this for a good reason. It's not just a story. Because she knew me better than anyone, and I knew me better than anyone, and we had both concluded that man cannot change. It's nothing. He's just going to have to work his days out and expire, you know? We came to that conclusion. She's at church. I'm home, miserable, and I concluded, I am so miserable. I already got loaded today. I'm drinking. I'm still miserable. Tomorrow morning is going to come. I'll get up, probably have a couple of drinks on my way to work, make me feel better. Let's do something, you know. I'll go to work. I'll be miserable. I'll get stoned after work. I'll be miserable. I'll come home and be miserable. And then one day, and I'm going, and I thought this through. I thought, one, then, then I'm going to go to hell. So I was becoming a believer. I said, you know, that's what I deserve. That's probably what's going to happen. I'm going to live like this, be miserable, and then die and be more miserable. And then what I did I called out and said, God, if it's not too late. I'd never read one of the chick tracks they gave me. I never knew the prayer on the back, you know. I just said, if it ain't too late. If you can do something. And God moved me that night. And uh, long story short, there was a Bible in the corner of our house behind the television that uh, a fellow had given me. It was a living Bible, simple translation. I just found it. I just was over. Actually, I was leaning over the television set, set weeping. God, if it's not too late. And as I'm doing that, I look, and here's this Bible down there, you know. Uh, so I grabbed it, opened it up on the table to John chapter 3. And, and it's a priest named Nicodemus. Like I said, I can't comprehend. I can't read a full paragraph, and my brain scrambles. It, but I read a man ask Jesus, what must I do? And I just felt I need to believe on him. And I believed. And I told him, God, I believe in you. Now I finally believe. Help me. Man, I tell you, I got saved that night. My wife came home. God is so good. I was so convinced I couldn't do this. And I couldn't be like those good people. I could not find my way. My wife knew it too. But you know, that night, God got through. She came home. Our little house, we had a little alcove like thing where you come in and so I heard my truck pull up I just sitting there at that table my back to the door but she didn't come in and then as I turned to look to see well I wonder if she's here she's peeking in the door and she saw me and she backs up I said I saw you <laughs> she says next question what are you doing and I held up that Bible I said I don't know but it feels so good amen and she came in and we wept and cried and were rejoicing before God and I don't think we slept for about three days we were just mind blown God cares about us I did not understand salvation I didn't understand where this would go I just knew that a few minutes ago I had absolutely no hope I, the only thing I was sure of I was gonna die and go to hell and now Man, God loves me. And you know, it was wonderful. And of course, she said, well, now we can go to church like a family. I said, well, no, no, I don't go to church. I got saved at home. I, that, was, that worked against me, guys. That wasn't smart at all. But, uh, and besides that, I had offended everyone in that church many times over. I said, I'm not going to that little church. No way. And so anyway, um, what happened was I I just didn't last very long. How many of you know it's hard to stay saved without church? Without brethren, pastor. So I'm failing miserably. I'm trying. I told my wife, you know, I'm just going to drink like a Baptist now. Sorry if you're a Baptist. Because I knew Baptist, man. The guy owned the bar, man. My best friend. Good Baptist, you know. So what does that mean? I'm going to drink at home and drink before dark, come home at a decent hour, you know. I'm going to do natural drugs. I I had no one. You know why I concluded this? Because I concluded it was wonderful. I I can believe, but I can't change. So I'm going to be a nice guy. 
I'm just not gonna, I'm gonna try to be nice. And I'll keep my old habits, moderation, be a nice guy. And so, guy came over from the church, guy was real close to Mark Canfield. Came in, visited me one day. He said, when are you gonna come to church? I said, you know what? I said, I've already told you, a man doesn't have to go to church. You know, I know these things, you know. Why should he have to go? And he began to talk to me, and this guy really cared about me, he knew me. Finally, he did put his bony finger in my face. We were in my living room, and he said, it's a shame to know what you know and still somehow end up in hell. He had a way with words, amen. <laughs> you know, you said, no, don't try that on your friends, amen. That's not a real good way to reach him. But what happened there, guys, is honestly, he knew me really, really well. I had many intimate conversations while I was fighting God. And he, you know, he was my ally till he got saved, and then he, you know. And so here he's making a point. You know what, Dave? You, you are backslid. Look, do you want to do this? I threw him out of my house. And uh, told my wife the next Sunday, let's go to church. And put her in the truck, drove to the Catholic church. And uh, she said, why? I said, honey, shh, don't. This is the house of God. Just be quiet. We go in. <laughs> I knew everything, you know. We went in, and uh, I couldn't wait to get out. See, I had been touched by the living God. And I could, these idols, I swear, they had a nine-foot Jesus on piano wire hanging on the... <laughs> Up here, you know, and everywhere I went, he was looking at me, you know, and <laughs> this place gave me the spooks, man. And I said, we can't, we just, you know, just, there's guys in there. Listen, I quit selling drugs, and the man, the last speed that, you know, that I sold to a man in that town, I sold to a guy, he's sitting in that church that morning, waving, <laughs> you know, happy to be there. He's got his wife and family. He's training to get on the sheriff's department. And I'm thinking, what's he doing here? Well, it's my church, Dave. The guy serving the communion alongside the priest owns the liquor store that had been poisoning me the entire time I lived up there. I said, there's something wrong. How many of you know? You, you, I saw men's lives change, so I'm ruined. I can't, I can't settle for that. Next Sunday, let's go to church. I took her down to another Holy Ghost church. I still wouldn't go to ours. It was, you know, church, spirit church. We went in there, and a guy preached a dandy sermon. It was kind of nice. But I saw other men in there that I knew from our little community. I had no idea they were Christians. They had me fooled, man. You're kidding. This guy is just like me. He's in this church, this family. Hi, Dave. Fella came up to me, and after church, said, so glad you're here. I said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I'm, holy, I'm Dave. I'm filled with the Spirit, and I teach Sunday school. I said, you know, I've known you for a full year. He worked in our little construction company alongside of us, and I did not know he was a Christian. A year. Here are these men preaching, to, you know, and arguing with me and everything all the time. But not this guy, he had a little mouse in the corner, you know. And I told him, I listened to me. I, I told him after I got right a couple weeks later, I told him I, I'd be ashamed to have Christianity like you. I was brand new. I didn't have a lot of tact, you know. And so, but I said, you know, I, I saw this in, in religion, so make a long story short, trying to shorten it up so I get this in. We showed up at the, the door. We called it Victory Chapel back then. And I got right with God. And the night I came, this was incredible. Small church, that patient church was so tiny. And in the same row I'm seated in, here's a guy. I, I get in. It's hard enough to come there. It's killing me. And uh, I put my little boy down on the seat, and then I do that. I look across the way, and this fellow's in the same row, and he's going, hey, man, welcome. He comes running over, shakes my hand, and I'm thinking, what are you doing here? Because this guy, I didn't know he got saved. He's saved. That's what he's doing there. And he's welcoming me. And I had just thrown him out of a bar probably a month before. Violent. I was a nasty little guy. I was like a little Tasmanian devil. Just a little guy, but filled with trouble. And here he is, and his wife's even greeting me, and she took a vow to kill me because I embarrassed her husband so bad. This is a strange thing, but that's life out there, you know? And so here they are, same row. And I'm thinking, my goodness, but I felt it, man. They, they said, come on in. The pastor welcomed us. The people didn't ask me uh, to take back any evil words. They, like, like they never heard anything. Just like, welcome, man. Grace of God accepted me. Now we're in church. 
I came the second night. I loved it. I came the third night, so excited. I told my wife on the way to church, I said, I got to ask this preacher on the second night. I said, I got to ask, they're having a revival. I said, I got to ask this guy, what are they doing, you know, when they're mumbling and all that stuff, you know, praising. She says, that's Holy Ghost. They speak in tongues. And so I said, I'll ask him about it. I'm going to ask him about it. As I'm walking up to the platform, he goes, hold on, brother. I have something for you. He goes back, hands me a book on speaking in tongues and being filled with the Holy Ghost. It tells me what it is. And I said, wow. And I took the book, never read it, but I took it. I didn't read. And uh, I just thought, man, God knows things, doesn't he? I'm going to ask about that. He intercepts me and says, this will help you understand. And uh, lo and behold, the third night, I'm praying just for God to help me. And the evangelist says, receive the Holy Ghost. And I did by accident. I didn't know how to receive the Holy Ghost. I didn't know how you do that. I don't know what it is, but he just prayed for me. A man had faith. The church prayed. I got filled. Uh, it scared me. I didn't want to speak in tongues. I didn't want to say things I don't understand, you know, uh, you know, whatever. I just scared. Went home. Wednesday night, I went to work. Wednesday, Wednesday evening after work, four o'clock, we're turning in our time cards. We're drinking beer. All the, all the Christian men split right away. I stayed with the guys. I'm telling them how good it is to be saved. Give me another beer. And uh, talking to them, we're drinking, carrying on. I'm still smoking, chewing, drinking. We're telling the boys they need to come to church. It's the real thing. It's so good. <laughs> hey, it's my fourth day being saved. I don't know. I hadn't heard no preaching on that. I'm worried about it because I'm afraid if they preach about it, I have to go to another church. We've already talked about that, my wife and I. She said, you're right, because you drink. You can't stop. Your whole family's that way. So I'm telling these boys, I go home after only three beers. And now I got filled with the Holy Ghost Tuesday night. This is Wednesday, three beers, and I feel like I'm slobbering drunk. So what is wrong with me? I'm, I'm freaking out. It's daytime. I'm driving home. I get home. My lovely wife, this is four, three days, four days in a row. I'm home before dark. On the same day, actually. Now I'm home. She meets me at the front door. She's leaning against the little post out there, and she cracks open a cold beer for me when I come in. She's just glad I'm there. She wants me to be happy. I took the beer and dumped it out. And she said, man. Before I knew it, she's standing there with all the beer from my refrigerator. You know, and then we emptied the liquor out of the cabinets. I got all my drug paraphernalia. Got cleaned out the house on Wednesday. Went on for God. And you know, these things were impossible for man. Grace teaches you. It enables you. I'm telling you, I, I wasn't going to attempt. I already told you, I was dead serious. I'm going to be, just smoke natural drugs. Christian. I, I'm, I'm going to drink nicely. I'm not going to pick fights. I'm going to you know, I'm going to be a good guy. That's my, you know why I said that? Because I didn't even want to think about trying to do something I can't do. How does someone like me stop doing these things? Grace teaches us to say no. You know, that's exactly what this says in verse 12 in our text. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions to live self-control. Let me tell you, I didn't know the word self-control. I had no control. And to live upright and godly in this present age. That means right where you are. Whatever you're doing in life and going through, God can make a way. Now listen, when I went from this elation, unspeakable joy, to this great deliverance, Holy Ghost, we're filled, we're excited, we're happy, it's grace, and we begin to live for God. We begin to have hope for our marriage, because it, it's just crazy. We were together, married five years, and it was, there was no marriage, it was insanity. Sorry, I'm still sorry about that, I'm still sorry. <laughs> well now, you know, God turns this around, and you know what? We're being taught how to be Christians. Grace teaches us, but you know, we're instructed, are we not? Read our Bibles. Get in the prayer room, man. Learn how to pray. Learn how to give. Those works. How many ever had people tell you, yeah, you guys are all into works? Look, that's what happens in our lives. 
We're not working for salvation. We're not earning favor with God. But because grace enables us, we begin to live this. So we teach folks to do these things. And that's where people get, oh, that works. And listen, I'm telling you, it's grace. I do, I do a lot of those things. Listen, I, ca I, I can't think of not praying or reading my Bible in the morning. I have to do that. It's not the law. It's a, I don't know how to live without it now. I, you know, it's, it's necessary. So these things, we memorize scripture, we meditate, we, we, you know, before the Lord, we, we live holy. But the problem is many people begin to grade themselves on that. I, I got this down now. I know how to do this. I'm, I'm the guy. I'm the girl. We, I got it. Listen, it's still grace. You're not making God happy, and that's why you're doing good. You're keeping yourself out of trouble, probably. We get excited about our perceived accomplishments, you know, and, and I'm going to tell you, uh, it's still grace. I'm almost going on 50 years of salvation pretty soon. It's still grace. I, I do live right, but it's still grace. But the problem is many will begin to live, clean up their lives, and forget about this grace. You know, well, I did A and B, and C is next. God's going to help me. You know, I do this, you know, and God's going to work. I'm going to tell you, you may do the best you can, level best you can do in life and for God, and you're going to still hit some spots where you're going to have to say help. If you don't have this understanding, you're going to be sideways with God because you did everything right. He didn't come through, and that's not true. It's still grace. There's a story about a young guy in college. He, he was a Christian, and in his college, they had a, a divinity class. So he took that, and he'd go to that, and he'd pack his books in there, you know, you know set them on his desk. And like all kids in college, you know, the other ones would be yucking it up, having fun. Class would start. He'd interact with everybody. He'd just sit there. Everything's by the book. And one day in that class a while, the professor finally asked him, you know, Man, you just really are by the book, aren't you? He goes, yes, sir. The way I was taught my Christianity. He said, it's by the book. Everything's by the book. He's, he said, you don't seem to even have joy. He goes, oh, I do. I know how to control it, you know. Right? He's, uh, he's right, but he does everything. The professor says, explain this to me. He says, listen, man, I know what I'm doing. And if I keep this all right and I do it all right and I'm by the book, I can expect God will reward by the book. I'm telling you, you better learn what grace is. He will help you. And you know, the other thing God will do through grace is, uh, you know, sometimes we, as just several of the former door directors were still licking their wounds out by the front door when I came in tonight and talking to Pastor Campbell and just joking around and stuff. But they, you know what? The, the grace of God is what disciplines us, guys, isn't it? Can you imagine if he just leaves us where we are? We think we've figured something out. I thought I had everything figured out. I knew how to be a Christian at home. That lasted all night, the first night. It was over. God left us where we were. We were lost. It would be horrible. If God leaves us anywhere at all along the line, thinking we've got it down, we know it all, he, he removed his grace, it would be horrible. And the good news is this, you know, he, he will correct those he loves. What kind of father would be he be if he didn't? You know, I love my sons. I raise sons. I got grandkids now and still ha interact with their lives. But, you know, I, I always loved them all. Even when they were stupid, I loved them. Still loved them. But didn't, maybe not pleased, but I loved them equally. You know, one couldn't do the right thing enough to make me happy and then the other. That's not how it is. How many of you know fathers aren't like that? And our father will discipline us. And believe me, that is grace that he's doing that by. And the good news is, like Philippians 1, 6 says, you know, you can be competent of this very thing. He that began this good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to make it happen, man. You need him to do that. Hebrews 13 it reflects on the same sentiment. You make, he'll make, verse 21, and make, he'll make you complete in every good work to do his will. Working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, whom he wants to get this done. So here we are. We managed to stay saved. It was easy. We just wanted to, we wanted God. We went to every prayer meeting. We went to every single outreach. One day during a fast, I caught my wife chewing gum and I thought she backslid. Amen. 
I had, I made her repent. I said, what are you bringing a curse on my home? We're, we're, we're Christians. We, we're seeking God. We're, we were doing things just, we loved God. And we were really trying and we did very well walking with God. But you know what? Two years into my salvation, my pastor is still preaching. We can take the land. Our church is starting to grow. We can send workers. We're going to reach the world. How many of you hear your preacher preach that? And you know it. But this is a little tiny town, Payson, Arizona. Dirty dozen. And I, who is he talking to? You know, I know these guys. Look at me, you know. We're going to reach the world. But he believed it. He would preach this. And I, some of the guys, you know, picked up some instruments, started making music, reaching out. We'd do an outreach and stuff. When pastor would preach, we'd bow our heads to pray. I would pray, God, help the man. He believes this stuff. I did. I did that, honestly. Even after I saved a little while, you know. He says, you got to get real here. He's, he thinks we're going to, you know, out of that little work, there are hundreds and some churches around the world today out of people's lives that went out from there. Who knows the other side of attorney is going to tell. But so, you know, I'm, I'm saying this for is because, number one, I didn't believe I could get saved. Number two, I didn't think to even try to be delivered, but God did it. Number three, I'm being called now after two years of salvation. I had not considered it. I was beginning to believe Dave could preach. John could preach. Mike could preach. And so I'm praying for these men. And finally, God stirred my soul. And then here's another impossibility. It says, man, God, I just figured out how to read a whole chapter in a day, you know. I called to preach. I can't communicate. I cannot stand in front of people. I'm, I'm still an introvert. I got these problems. You know, I'm living right, but I can't do this. I want to tell you that grace, it teaches you and it enables you. It helps us. And it teaches us more than just the salvation experience. So God's making me a responsible man before I was saved I had never paid a bill. I'm in my 20s. I paid the drug dealers, paid the courts, but I never paid a bill. After we're saved, my wife had to leave town for something. I remember going down personally, taking money down to the electric company and standing in line there to pay them. And give me a receipt. They take a picture. <laughs> I'm serious, man. I was just the most irresponsible thing. And I'm called to preach. God, you have to do something. And he did. And I want to tell you, you can never underestimate the grace of God. And, and moreover, you can never disregard it. Think things are all right. Good enough. You need to know it. The Apostle Paul, and we all know of him. And the truth is, he was the Saul of Tarsus. He was a nasty booger. He was in trouble with God, with himself, with men. An evil man, but he got saved. That was grace. And listen to what he says in Ephesians 3, 2. He said, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. That makes a, that's just a whole different way of hearing that in the light of a sermon like this, you know. He said, this was given to me, this dispensation, this what God is giving out today through Jesus, this grace is given to me for you. Not just the Ephesians, but for us. That we would know by the revelation he made known to me, the mystery as I briefly already written, by which when you read, you, will, uh, uh, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of man. Now it's been revealed by the spirit of his, to his holy apostles and prophets. Verse 6 there, this is Ephesians 3, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. He says, man, I solidly identify with this grace. It is a special gift from God. It is given to me, not just for me, but to give ministering. And then he said, it was given to me, verse eight, less, I am less than the least of the saints. This grace was given. 
that I might preach among the Gentiles these unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, what, what has God given you? Oh, I got saved, you know. I, I fill a chair in the church. You got a testimony if he saved you. There's somebody, there's some bodies that need to hear what God did in you. There's some things in your life that you might settle for and say this is acceptable and it's just the way it is because I know me, I know my circumstances, I know my spouse, I know my boss, I know that, I know. What about grace? You can change the impossible. We're called to believe that and respond to that. Would you bow your heads to pray with me tonight for a moment? What about grace? Grace.